Folks, we are so close to the regular season. I'm super excited. But before it gets started, we've got to cover some tight end rankings in a market that is getting scarcer and scarcer by the minute when it comes to consistent, reliable fantasy football production. Starting off in the S tier, Travis Kelsey. No debate here, of course. This guy is in his own tier for a reason. When you have someone who has been tight end one in standard PPR for six of the last seven seasons, especially with the quarterback play of Patrick Mahomes at his disposal the last few years, it's a no-brainer. Travis Kelsey is fourth all-time in tight end touchdowns, and yes, he's turning 34 years old this fall, but I don't see him falling enough to lose his spot considering he outplayed the field by five points per game in 2022. We kick off the eights here with Mark Andrews, someone who has been far and away the favorite target for Lamar Jackson the last few years. The Ravens, they have been among the top three in the league for most tight end targets in three of the last four years. The volume has been and is still there. Yes, there may be volume competition if Rashad Bateman and OBJ can stay healthy, and especially if Zay Flowers makes an impact, but I will gladly go with a tight end who is averaging right at 100 targets per season five years into his career. TJ Hogginson is right behind him, and I mean right behind him. Two and three could go either way. He obviously just got paid. The Vikings showed a sense of investment in him as he signed a four-year, $66 million extension. The man set a career high in receptions, yards, and touchdowns while giving us nine double-digit fantasy performances last year. He also scored 30 points on two occasions. The 8.6 targets per game he saw in Minnesota's pass-heavy offense is the highest rate we have seen in his career as well. I love the situation for TJ Hawkinson. I think it only gets better. George Kittle has powered through what has mostly been a run-dominant culture in San Francisco to give us at least 13 fantasy points per game every year except for his rookie year in 2017. George Kittle is a phenomenal blocking tight end. That's why he sees so many snaps. He'll miss a game here and there, and he shows up as questionable, seemingly more than most tight end options in the market, but the guy has played in 29 of 34 games in the last two years and is still only 29 years of age. I feel pretty all right with him. Let's start off the beats here with someone who has been stealing headlines since landing in New York. That's right, it's Darren Waller. I'm cautiously optimistic with this one while weighing a pair of factors one being lack of volume competition around him, and the other, very important one, being health. The Giants made it very clear that their playmakers are Saquon Barkley, Daniel Jones through the air and on the ground, and now Darren Waller, that's where the money went, and money does talk. The other biggest target ad was Paris Campbell, who had a career-best 600 receiving yards last year, but historically, Waller has attracted more volume. Lack of availability, however, that's the risk you take if you do jump for Waller. While he has an ADP of 53, understand that this man has missed 14 games in the last two seasons combined. It's a risk you're going to run. Evan Ingram arguably has the most volume competition on this list, outside of another guy I mentioned way later in this video, but he caught fire as a favorite target of Trevor Lawrence down the stretch last year. He ended the season as tight end five and had at least eight targets in three of the last five weeks. There's an obvious conflict with Calvin Ridley stepping into the receiving core, but Ingram's another recently signed tight end coming off of a phenomenal year. This guy was a pivotal part of the team's playoff run last year into the second round. At number seven, a lot of people are disappointed in the production of Kyle Pitts and understandably so after he was drafted as a supposed generational talent out of Florida at the tight end position a couple of years ago. He only caught 28 of 59 targets last year. That is extremely concerning. You guys have also heard me say this time and time again, but the Falcons ran the ball more often than every team not named the Chicago Bears in 2022. So not too much volume in the passing game, but the book isn't really written on Desmond Ritter. He's just getting started. Look, in Kyle Pitts' rookie year, he just had one touchdown, yet he finished as tight end six. That was a thousand yard season. Obviously there's Bijan Robinson and Drake London, but year three of Kyle Pitts' rookie contract serves high stakes. And I think both Kyle Pitts and the Atlanta Falcons are very aware of that. Pat Fryermuth starts off our seats here, and I'd still consider him as pretty underrated. He's being drafted as tight end 10, despite being top five among tight ends in targets per game last year with a mark of 6.5. He also broke free with 13 of his 63 receptions being for 20 or more yards, so a big play guy. Fryermuth finished as tight end 7 last year while weathering a QB change and a rocky start for Kenny Pickett. I would not doubt it if Fryermuth rises above my expectations and ends up breaking the top five. If you're looking for a consistent tight end 
who is going to keep you in the game. Dallas Goddard is your guy. At least 50 receptions and 600 yards in each of the last four years. No complaints there. He is the definition of stability. Now, if you're someone who jumps for that elite level tight end in rounds four or five during that dead zone, if you will, at the running back position, ignore this for your fantasy draft. Do not jump for Goddard. But if you want to prioritize an elite quarterback like Jalen Hurts, Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, or even Joe Burrow, and you see some possible stack or just high upside wide receivers in those middle rounds, and you want to take a tight end later, Dallas Goddard is a stress-free pick that you know will be around for that extra time. David Njoku went through a treacherous passing attack in Cleveland last year, and Deshaun Watson putting up career low numbers just didn't help at all he was third in target share on the team behind Amari Cooper and Donovan Peoples Jones last year yet had a higher catch rate than both of them at 73 percent I'm interested to see what happens with the Browns obviously going after Elijah Moore and adding him to the offense combine that with the fact that they have a top five running back that they lean heavily on in Nick Chubb and I have Njoku safely at the 10 spot here. Dalton Kincaid is the first rookie on the board, and it's super hard for the fantasy world to believe in rookie tight ends, right? Especially with the recent sting of Kyle Pitts so far not panning out. We just mentioned that. But the passing attack in Buffalo, combined with the fact that Kincaid racked in 70 catches with eight scores in his junior year at Utah, Dawson Knox also cleared 70 targets in a season with Buffalo not too long ago, but Kincaid is a much better raw prospect and should get some of Knox's volume. Tyler Higby is in a unique situation, to say the very least. His value is going to fluctuate all year long, depending on Cooper Cup. If Cooper Cup is healthy, this guy's share of the offense is going to suffer. That is no secret. There aren't many receivers out there who can hold down an average of over 130 targets per season when they play the whole season. Well, with Cooper Cup hurt last year, we saw the latter. Tyler Higby stepped in and brought in the fourth highest target total of any tight end at 104. Cooper Cup currently has a nagging hamstring injury. He just went to go and see a specialist monitor him, and that will dictate Tyler Higby's fantasy ceiling. Going into the deets here, I'll probably get clowned for this one, but Juwan Johnson is in such a great spot. I'm saying he's our tight end 13, and here's why. He racked in the most receiving touchdowns of any Saints player last year with seven, and Derek Carr, who was on a Raiders team that was top 10 in tight end target percentage in three of the last four years, is now his quarterback. I am declaring this a match made in heaven. Let's also keep the three-game suspension of Elvin Kamara and constant injury threat that is Michael Thomas in the back of our heads for volume opportunity. After being tight end 15 in an offense that had question marks all over at the QB position last season, I like a slight step forward from Juwan Johnson in 2023. With so many moving parts around Cole Komet, I will admit he is one tough cookie to evaluate. On one hand, Komet was the Bears' leading receiver last year with just over 500 yards. On the other hand, Chicago runs the ball literally more than anyone else and added DJ Moore along with Robert Tunyon to the mix. The Bears did sign Cole Komet to a four-year $50 million deal in the offseason, so I don't see his involvement in the offense going anywhere. There's just going to be some conflicting factors. Dalton Schultz is coming off of his third straight year inside of the top 12 for tight ends in fantasy from a total point scored perspective. He has missed just two games in the last four years, so he's super durable. But there is a sharp contrast between the Dallas Cowboys offense and a Houston Texans offense that has been scraped clean, new quarterback and all. It's hard to say anybody on that offense will be in the top 12 at their position, but you can't discount the fact that Dalton Schultz is arguably the best option on this team right now. He might be the security blanket for C.J. Stroud. And more importantly, Schultz should see touches in a pass-heavy scheme when Houston faces late-game deficits, which I'm going out on a limb here. I feel like they're going to be losing a lot of ball games. Chigakonkwo came out of nowhere to end his rookie season with four double-digit fantasy performances in his final six games. I think the ceiling could be a lot higher if the quarterback situation was a stable one. But with the Titans going out and grabbing Will Levis in the second round, I doubt we see Tannehill for all 17 games. And as a result, that could impact the ceiling of a Conquo. Let's go to the Eats here. Sam Laporta has some shoes to fill in Detroit after the midseason departure of TJ Hawkinson last year. This incoming rookie went to tight end university in Iowa and finished out his final two years in college with over 50 catches and 600 yards in each year. He only had five touchdowns in total across a couple of years, but outside of Amon Ross St. Brown, I think there's an opportunity to be had in terms of volume for Laporta. We'll go back-to-back -back rookies here, and this one may seem bold at the 18 spot, but I love Luke Musgrave in this rather vacant tight end room. 
Robert Tunyon and Mercedes Lewis are out of the door, and Musgrave looked solid in preseason with five catches for 36 yards in minimal time. The main reason I have Musgrave this high is because I think he can be that reliable red zone target for Green Bay. He fits the profile, six foot six, over 250 pounds, and we saw Robert Tunyon break out for 11 touchdowns in 2020, year two in Matt LaFleur's system. Gerald Everett finished last season in the middle of the pack at tight end 14, but I don't know if that receiving core could have been more bruised up and if he could have had a more optimal situation considering all of the weapons around him. Gerald Everett played in 16 games and he set some career highs across the board while Keenan Allen and Mike Williams missed significant time. I'm super excited to see what Kellen Moore can unlock in this offense and hopefully Everett's downfield involvement can be one of those aspects because he only averaged 9.6 yards per reception last year. It wasn't long ago that Taysom Hill was a cheat code at the tight end position when you look at fantasy if the guy threw a 50-yard touchdown pass with a few rushes and some receptions sprinkled in there well lucky you the thing to watch out for with a swiss army knife like hill is that he's just a specialty player at the end of the day the last time that Taysom hill was in a game for more than 50 percent of the snaps was week 17 of the 2021 season his versatility is super exciting but his involvement limits him out of the F tier, you have a combination of players who are looking to either establish themselves but haven't yet, and the outlier is someone who is a bit over the hill. Greg Dolchich falls into that first pool. This guy was fired out of a cannon when he started, but that's relative to his performances later in the year. In his first three weeks, Dolchich scored 12.4, 11.1, and 12.7 points, and then he saw some trouble considering he could only haul in 33 of his 55 targets on the year. Denver's offense also just doesn't excite me, and I am this close to hoping that Jared Stidham just takes the job over midseason. Jake Ferguson gets a massive promotion in Dallas's offense with Dalton Schultz leaving. Last year, Dallas had the eighth highest tight end share percentage in the league, and at least in the small percentage of what we saw from Jake Ferguson in 2022, it was actually pretty impressive. 19 catches out of 22 targets, so nearly a 90% catch rate, well, well, well above league average. Obviously, the sample size isn't there along with just south of 200 yards and a pair of touchdowns. Now, those aren't numbers you want your fantasy tight end to have, per se, but they're an indicator of potential, and now Ferguson is in a position to show off that potential. Okay, so remember that over-the-hill player I said would be in this tier? That's Zach Ertz. Travis Kelsey may be older than Zach Ertz, but he hasn't been showing alarming signs of slowing down or a downtick in production. Zach Ertz, on the other hand, he has. Ertz missed seven games last year, and ever since his year six season in 2018, we have first seen the Eagles and then the Cardinals slowly dial back his usage. He went from 156 targets to 135 to 112, and then of course he was hurt last year, but he also saw a career low in yards per reception in 2022 at 8.6 with not nearly as much touchdown upside. Arizona does run a fast offense and can usually be found around the top 10 in plays run per game, so he does have that going for him, but outside of that, Zach Ertz, I think the book is nearly written on him. Michael Meyer sits at the 24 spot. He's an exciting prospect out of Notre Dame who set a school record for receptions and receiving yards a couple of years ago, but he is surrounded by some talent that will demand plenty of touches. Devontae Adams had a target share percentage north of 32% last year. Hunter Renfro, he's only two years removed from a 1,000-yard season. Josh Jacobs had over 300 touches last year and excelled. I think the point of entry is going to be a little tougher for this rookie. And Irv Smith Jr. squeaks into this list at number 25. We saw Irv Smith's Jr. upside a little bit with the Vikings. He did put 365 yards and five touchdowns on the board in 2020 with Minnesota. And now he enters another high-flying offense in Cincinnati. Yes, of course, there is plenty of target competition with Jamar Chase, with Tyler Boyd with T. Higgins, but Hayden Hurst managed to get a couple of nice performances out of this offense, and I'm going to be honest, folks, the tight end market, as I mentioned at the beginning, is thin, so you're going to get some unproven guys in this range who you are banking on having some breakout performances. Thank you for watching, as always. Folks, drop any questions I was unable to answer in the comment section below. Like and subscribe if I helped you get a little better at fantasy football today, and we will see you in the next video.